it gets me really excited for that. Welcome everyone to our to the second iteration of our new Voices on Eurasia talk, um, hosted by Ponars. Ponars is a network of a, about 150 academics working on all things Eurasia in North America and abroad. And the new Voices on Eurasia speaker series is one of our, I don't know, proudest event series where we invite the youngest and brightest scholars working on Eurasia. We have had sociologists, political scientists, economists, anthropologists come out to Washington and deliver talks encapsulating and contextualizing their research for a broader policy community. And we have talks about every month. So thank you very much for attending both online and in person. We're thrilled to have Elizabeth Stetson, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Stetson University joining us today. Elizabeth is one of the few scholars that I know of personally who compares Russia and China in a deliberate and thought through and comprehensive way, who knows both countries extremely well. Um, I've always been impressed by her work on civil society and on environmental protection and activism and I, I just can count on one hand the people that I know who know both countries as deeply as she does. So I'm thrilled to have her with us today presenting new research on Russian emigres. She'll talk for about 30 to 35 minutes. I'll kick things off with the first question um, and we'll jump into the, the audience both online and in person. Um, so please prepare your questions. We have more than enough time for discussion afterwards. So thank you very much for coming and I'm delighted to hand the stage to Elizabeth. Thank you, David. And thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak to you and to engage more with policymakers on this really important topic. Um, I see there's something in the chat, so we'll just check. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, so the title of the talk today is Opportunities and Constraints for Russian Activists in Exile After Russia's 2022 Invasion of Ukraine. It's a project that I never thought that I would do. I think that there are many people who were in that boat. I had a grant to go back to both China and Russia in summer 2022. Zero COVID and Russia's invasion of Ukraine made both of those plans impossible. So I quickly rewrote the grant um, and tried to think about ways in which I could be a part of understanding this new wave of activists in exile that we're leaving after uh, February 24th, 2022. So that's where this project comes out of. Um, and I'm also bringing in some insight from another project on international NGOs and foundations that operated in both Russia and China over time. Um, just in, in, in this talk, how they interact or th are thinking about interacting with activists in exile. But that's also part of a broader separate project that's compared with Russia and China. To put this um, in context, I wanted to start with some motivation. It sounds like last week you were already talking about these waves, this wave of immigration, but I wanted to put it into broader context for political immigration from Russia that this is not new. It's not like it started right after February 24, 2022. Um, during Putin's third term as president, the US saw an increase in asylum seekers from Russia nearing the highest level since the 1990s. So if you look at the bottom of this graph, I know it's kind of small on the screen, um, 94 is this largest bar of asylum applications from um, Russians to the United States. And then we see that it's almost as big in 2016. Um, so after Putin's third term and things started to, to seem a little bit uh, harder for political activists to continue to do their, their work in Russia. Um, certainly this is just data on the United States. There are of course, Russians seeking asylum or who have sought humanitarian visas all over the world um, since Putin, the start of Putin's third term. Certainly since February 24th, 2022, we've now seen immigration rates from Russia skyrocket, as many Russian citizens opposing the war or afraid of its impacts have scrambled to flee. We don't have great data on this yet either, but one way that we could look at it is, um, this is a graph uh, from the economist of Google searches for certain terms uh, in Russia. So there were some for flights, immigration, visa, political asylum, and you see that all of those graphs then skyrocket in February. Um, after February 24th, 2022. Um, so we've seen thousands of people leave um, since that time. <laughs> 
What I'm interested in is a subpopulation of those who have left since February 24th, 2022. So among this wave of emigrants is a subpopulation of Russian activists who saw their exit from Russia as a choice between prison and exile. These are motivated, um, very active people that were doing things that they know had risks associated with it while they were in country in Russia. And then for... Um, one reason or another decided to leave, either be immediately following February 24th because of their anti-war position or concern that threats made to them because of their activism were actually going to come to fruition. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Some stayed until partial mobilization and then decided to leave. Some stayed even beyond that until there was an, a credible threat, um, maybe a criminal case pending against them. But we have seen an increase of um, political activists during this period of time from February 24, 2022 to present um, who have left. And so I put a quote on the slide um, from an interview with an opposition activist who's now in Tallinn from August of 2022, talking about his decision to leave. So this particular activist had still been in, was still in Russia uh, in February and even early March 2022, had attended a lot of uh, anti-war protests, early anti-war protests in Russia, had gone to jail for 14 days for participation in one of those protests, and then realized that he needed to leave. So he said, I am of the mind that you can't do anything useful while sitting in prison. A few of our colleagues in the opposition, like Ilya Yashin, they don't share that opinion. They are willing to sit in prison. But I sat there for 14 days, and I understood that I can't influence anything from there. I can do absolutely nothing, nothing useful, and no one can help if something happens to me. He's not the only person who said this type of thing to me during interviews. This was um, a regular refrain, right? If I stay, I know what will happen to me. I will go to prison. And while it, it's noble, perhaps, for these high-profile activists to go to prison, who's really going to care about me and what what is it that I could actually do? And so a lot of these activists that left see their position abroad as being... Um, giving them more opportunities than staying within the country and going to prison. This leads to several key questions for the talk for today that relate to um, a couple of different academic projects for me. One, a simple question of how are these new activists in exile continuing their activism from abroad? What kinds of things are they doing? Are they doing the same sorts of things? Are they engaging in anti-war activism? Are they doing different things? So we'll look at that. Second, how do they interact with policymakers and civil society actors in their host countries, and how are those interactions shaped by the host country environment? This is the more academic question, looking at political constraints and opportunities using you know, the social movement literature to understand how that shapes the type of activism that we see in different contexts. Um, this is where I have a, a paper that will be part of a special issue. That's where that paper is focused. And then for the purposes of this talk, I had mentioned that I'm bringing in some of my other research on international NGOs and foundations. We could ask this question of how they're interacting with this group of new exiled activists. And so I took a portion of some interviews that I've done with international NGOs and foundations for the comparative project with China and Russia um, to, to pull in some information to answer that question. To nest this one within the academic literature, understanding that we don't want to go deep into the weeds of academic literature in this type of talk, I just want you to understand where it is that this is nested. A lot of us who are looking at activism from abroad or what it means to have immigrants abroad and whether or not it matters, a lot of us are nesting this work underneath Albert Hirschman's idea of exit, voice, and loyalty originally conceived to explain why people would express or how people would express dissatisfaction with a firm, it's since been used in lots of ways to talk about how people would express dissatisfaction with a political regime. So they could either exit, you know, leave the political regime, go abroad, um, leave and, and not have a voice, or they could stay and express their dissatisfaction with the regime, or they could express loyalty to the regime and support it. When Albert Hirschman originally conceived of this, he thought of them as alternatives. He then went later to say that, in fact, they weren't alternatives, and a lot of other scholars did as well. So to the second point here, 
Exit could in fact enable voice. And a lot of scholarship had started to point that out really early on after this framework had first come out and that both voice and loyalty are possible after exit. If you're thinking about studies of remittances of diaspora communities, that could be a show of loyalty back to uh, the home state, right? You could express voice if you are um, an activist in exile because you are maybe engaging with your host country institu political institutions to put pressure on your home state or something like that. So scholars were very quick to point out that these things, in fact, weren't alternatives. So now there's this rich scholarship on the broad role of diaspora groups that, that fits in with some of these ideas about exit voice and loyalty. Um, there's also scholarship on anti-regime or political oppositions and exile, like the Tibetan government in exile. But where our work fits in, and I say our in the case that I had worked on this before with a colleague, uh, fits in the subcategory of activists in exile. So these are people who are engaged in activism in their home country, targeted by the regime and forced to flee abroad. They're different, I would argue, from a larger diaspora. They're different from an organized government in exile. Maybe they'll become one, but they aren't right now. These are people who were activists on various types of topics while they were in country, and now they're potentially the most likely to continue to do that type of work from abroad. So in uh, work with a colleague, Laura Henry at Bowdoin, we looked at this idea of activists in exile, and we were looking at Russian environmental activists because that's who we had both studied previously um, to understand those that had left during Putin's third term how it is that they could, could, could still engage in activism from abroad. Uh, so this is a table from that piece uh, where we looked at the effects of exit on voice. So yes, you can leave the country and continue to have voice, but it's limited in some ways, or you're making trade-offs. And so we tried to model those trade-offs. We also used um, Guillermo O'Donnell's ideas about horizontal versus vertical voice. Horizontal voice, the idea that you know activists are speaking to sort of a domestic audience horizontally to other citizens or maybe other activist groups. Vertical voice, speaking to political institutions or politicians trying to work up the chain. Um, and so if we think about activists that stay in country, no exit, um, they are perhaps constrained while they stay within the country as it gets more repressive in terms of having their horizontal voice. It's much harder for them um, perhaps to do that. In terms of vertical voices, it's practically impossible, right? They, be, they become targets of repression. It's very difficult to have vertical voice, but they could at least maintain that legitimacy by staying in country to keep some semblance of horizontal voice among activists or among other citizens. Exit changes those dynamics. So activists that leave uh, increase their ability to have vertical voice because now they can interact with host country institutions, perhaps, tra perhaps transnational institutions um, through what we called empowered exile. But they also deal with this issue of, of delegitimizing themselves simply because they're no longer in the country and trying to stay engaged with what's happening with the activist community or citizens within country through remote engagement. And so their horizontal voice decreases. For this particular slice of this project, I'm focusing more on what impacts exit. Um, so what impacts horizontal and vertical voice and the opportunities and constraints available to these activists once they're abroad? Um, so this study is focusing on the impact of the host country context and how it can uh, impose constraints and opportunities on vertical voice and empowered exile. A little bit more academic background for the paper, right? Um, so I decided to look at Germany and Estonia. So I have a paired comparison case study of both countries. Both are in the EU. Both are part of the Schengen zone, which becomes really important in a moment. Um, and both have significant Russian populations. As a percent of, popula percent of the total population, um, the Russian speaking population in Germany is smaller than as a percent of the Estonian population, but by, by raw numbers, they're actually quite similar. Um, and they're the top two in the EU. <clears throat> but they certainly differ on their history with Russia, one experiencing Soviet occupation and the other um, having a very complicated historical memory relationship with Russia um, and the Soviet Union at the end of World War II and throughout the, the Cold War, um, such that they have 
taken very different stances with respect to visa policies for Russian migrants. Um, so Estonia and several other Baltic states and Finland decided in September of 2022 to restrict and no longer um, accept the Schengen issued Schengen visas for Russian citizens, short term Schengen visas, which really um, was a shock, sent shockwaves through Europe um, that, you know, you could do that, you could make that choice. Um, whereas Germany has extended an existing policy that they have for humanitarian organizations, uh, humanitarian um, assistance to allow um, Russian activists, political activists in particular, to take advantage of that. And many have been granted humanitarian visas. So the last time that I saw the figure, it's over 1,500 Russians since the start of the invasion have been granted humanitarian visas to go to Germany. Um, so they've taken very different approaches. And so I wanted to understand how did that difference in visa policies and the structure of you know, welcoming uh, Russian political activists or not, change their ability to, to mobilize. So I conducted interviews in summer 2022, as I had said before, I had this grant, I needed to use it. So I went to both um, Estonia and Germany that summer. And then I went back this summer um, to conduct mostly follow-up interviews because there had been so many policy changes in the past year that affected um, their ability to mobilize. So the visa bans happened in September of 2022, and certainly we all know that partial mobilization in Russia started in September 20, 2022 as well, which um, changed some of the dynamics for who was trying to leave and claim political asylum or, or humanitarian obtain a humanitarian visa. I also have some remote interviews with international NGO and foundations um, that I conducted this year um, for that larger project that I'll continue. And um, if anyone's interested in it for the q and I have a parallel project looking at mainland Chinese and Hong Kong activists in exile and their interaction with international NGOs and foundations um, that I'm happy to talk about as well for the comparison. Then also, as any good social scientist, I have some secondary sources to try to triangulate the interview material and provide additional data, particularly if there is some meeting that has publicly available information. Maybe there's a recording of a meeting that happened or um, you know, an event poster or something like that where I could corroborate that these things happened and, and who was involved. So those, those are the data uh, sources that I'm using. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about my interviewees. So who was it that I was talking to? It's a small number of people, but they have very particular characteristics. So one, they have to have been involved in activism before leaving Russia to be in my data set. Um, some of the main areas of activism include environment and climate, human rights and historical memory, think um, activists from Memorial, labor union organizing, like those involved in um, Alliance Frache, um, democratic, those involved in democratic elections like Golis, or maybe they had run themselves or worked with Navalny's smart, smart voting or something like that. So all sorts of different activists. Most of them that I interviewed had fled after February 24th, 2022, but I also interviewed several like older activists who fled in an earlier wave, um, usually do it during Putin's third term on forward um, for other reasons related to their individual level of threat. But those that fled since the start of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine fled because they felt that they were in danger. Fears of persecution for their activism or their anti-war stance, fears of full mobilization, or even fear of martial law. Many people talked about how in the early days they didn't really know if the borders were going to close or not um, and left just as soon as they could. The other thing that has to be true about them to be included is that they have to be involved in continued activism in some way from abroad. I would put the caveat there though that even if I selected them that way in 2022, during follow-up interviews, some of them who were involved in activism in 2022 had stopped by 2023. Not very many of them, but I think it speaks to problems of a lack of support, lack of routes to uh, legalization through uh, different issues with visas um, and burnout. A lot of these activists are facing burnout, um, really burning the candle at both ends for over a year. So what are some of the things that they're doing? 
So in terms of their forms of continued activism, there are some who are continuing in some way what their original activities were. Um, for example, <clears throat> There's an environmental activist and journalist in Berlin um, who is a part of the Ukraine War Environmental Consequences Work Group, who's focusing on trying to document um, how the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is uh, also creating environmental catastrophe uh, with, with several other um, Russian scholars and activists who are also now living abroad. Um, there are those that have shifted towards anti-war activism, so um, organizing protests, um, focusing on anti-war resistance. Maybe one of the more famous examples is the feminist anti-war resistance. And others are helping fleeing Russians or Ukrainians, either um, through helping Ukrainian refugees in their current host country, or helping those that had got, um, those who were pulled into filtration camps into Russia, uh, figure out how to get out of Russia and back into a European country. <clears throat> and so there is a project called Druzia Mariupola um, that you, you see the emblem on the slide where uh, Russian activists were very, who were in Estonia were very closely involved with that project of figuring out how to get Ukrainians across the border from Russia into Estonia, working with an entire network sort of underground um, of, of activists who were still in Russia. Similarly, um, many Russian activists in exile are also working with Helping to Leave, an organization that was helping to get Ukrainians out um, from the front lines. Another organization that a lot of Russian activists in exile are working with is uh, Edith Yelisam, um, trying to, after partial mobilization, trying to help young men um, avoid the draft. In terms of differences between Germany and Estonia, the visa policies have had a major impact because they're also indicative of just the broader political and social climate in these places towards um, Russian political exiles. So in Germany, I, I've noticed that there's more formalized groups founded by both old and new activists in exile, more coordinated effort to bring those groups together. I wanted to give you a, a timeline of a couple of these events as they've happened over the last year or so. So there was a big event um, that was coordinated by Demokratia, which is uh, founded by, by Russian activists in exile who left well before the invasion of Ukraine, um, but who were interested in trying to get all these new anti-war groups that have popped up around Berlin and Germany writ large together to coordinate. So they had their first um, you know, citizens anti-war forum in Ger of Germany in Berlin in October 2022. Then in December 2022, there was a larger Congress of anti-war initiatives um, that was held in Berlin as well. And then just this June, when I was talking to activists, they were telling me about um, how they were preparing for a meeting of municipal deputies in Bonn, uh, trying to figure out, because many of the municipal deputies, um, over 100 of them have received humanitarian visas to Germany, and they are also now engaged in figuring out what they're going to do next. In Estonia, it's less formalized. There are loose networks. They're working on their own projects. Um, you know, some of them are involved in Drusia Mariupola. Some of them are involved in, you know, helping Ukrainians through um, childcare, education initiatives, um, or helping um, young men free, flee from mobilization and the draft. They do come together periodically for anti-war protests in front of the Russian embassy. Um, or help each other on an ad hoc basis. So um, some activists would say like, oh yeah, I work with so-and-so sometimes if they have a Ukrainian refugee who needs help and I can help drive them you know, from Narva to Tallinn or something, I will do that. But it's, it was much less formalized um, and they all knew each other but weren't trying to sort of coordinate in this larger structure. In terms of interactions with policymakers, um, certainly there is this sense of increased vertical voice that we had thought of before, but it differs based on host country characteristics. So in Germany, there's a high level of lobbying for legalization routes and financial support. They've been very involved in the humanitarian visas, even checking lists of um, activists because you have to make a good case for why you need a humanitarian visa and working alongside German policymakers to do that. And German, German policymakers have been more receptive to that um, versus those in Estonia have made some attempts to try to discuss 
the visa situations for Russian activists, but Estonian policymakers are less receptive, understandably so, um, but to the point where Estonian, um, those that are in Estonia have stopped trying to engage as much with Estonian policymakers. And so that has pushed, um, in both cases, really working at the EU, EU level um, within those political institutions to address the concerns at the EU level. German policymakers want that to happen because they would rather have you know, EU-wide policy. Um, and certainly Russian activists that are in Estonia aren't getting very far with their host country institutions and hopping up to the EU level. There are also a lot of interactions between old exile groups and new exile groups. In terms of these cross-border interactions, so these are happening sort of as larger umbrella movements of, of trying to unite um, Russian activists in exile through these networks. So Forum Svobodne Rasi has existed for a while. It has, you know, these well-known elite Russian um, opposition activists who have been abroad for a long time involved in it. They're, they're trying to do things with, you know, this broader group. There's um, the anti-war committee, which has tried to figure out how to connect all of these anti-war activists together um, in 2022. 2022 in Prague, there was this other um, attempt at trying to bring all of the European anti-war initiatives together. There's still a lot of um, movement here, a lot is in flux. And I, I wanted to put an interview quote on the slide here as well, because I think it, it encapsulates how people are thinking about this. So they have appeared like mushrooms and sprouted different initiatives, which is super, but right now the problem is internal communication. And so there's all of these things going on and they're not, um, making attempts to really figure out how to communicate with one another and, and consolidate. <clears throat> this question of opposition from abroad. So in 2022, political activists that I was speaking with were grappling with how best to move forward with opposition activism from outside of Russia, because it was something that they had not done before. Um, so this is again, <clears throat> the same um, interviewee in fact, that I had quoted before who had been in Russia until you know March 2022, after he got out of prison and he left. And he said, to change something from the streets, which we thought was possible before, is now impossible. The only thing that is left is to prepare people abroad from wherever they fled to during the war for how the regime will change. When it changes in the end, we should go back and take part in reforming the new Russia. That's all we can do right now. So this was sentiment that he had expressed in August of 2022, and it really encapsulates where the movement has gone in the last year. And so this sentiment has sort of taken off as a theme for a lot of these projects to say, well, we should be prepared for the moment when we could possibly go back. So by 2023, there's more coordination and consolidation around those goals of opposition activism from abroad of, you know, maybe we can increase our democratic experience and get ready to go back. <clears throat> but I wanted to highlight um, two projects where division really persists within this movement. <clears throat> One is First Flight, um, and that's a new project that appeared this year, earlier this summer. So I was asking people about it a lot because it was new and no one really knew what it was. Um, but the idea is that if you sign up and you get vetted, you would be on a list to be on the, some of the first flights back to Russia whenever it was deemed time to go back. Um, and there was a lot of skepticism about this project, but it has continued, right? Talk of it has continued since it was first announced in, you know, May or June of this year. Um, and I was just looking at a social media post from the other day that they were, um, having, I think, I think it's tomorrow. There's a, there's a conference tomorrow or Saturday, um, where they're going to talk about what those next steps might be. Um, so if you are interested in being on one of those first flights back to Russia, what will that look like? You know, how can we prepare for that moment from abroad? The other initiative that I wanted to point out, um, is the, Congress of People's Deputies, which has created a lot of division um, among activists abroad. This is Ilya Panamaryov's group, um, and it has created divisions over the role of violence. Um, so in 2022, no one was really talking about these issues, but this summer, this was one of the main things that we were discussing. The idea that um, maybe 
some activists abroad endorsed using violence or acts of sabotage, um, like, you know, burning down draft offices in Russia, or that there was support for people going to fight on behalf of Ukraine um, as Russians. I had a lot of conversations with people about this, and there are some people who feel very strongly that they want nothing to do with anyone who is talking about condoning violence. And so this is a division that um, will be much more difficult to overcome moving forward, and it's one that I wanted to highlight. This last piece of the puzzle from some of my other work is how these groups are potentially interacting with funders, right? International NGOs and foundations. And international NGOs and foundations have their own thoughts about this group of people. And there's a big dilemma for them about their mission to support civil society in Russia, not abroad. That they, um, a lot of these foundations were started with the mission to help say civil society develop in Russia or help um, democratic forces in Russia. And so supporting activists in exile is hard for them because it means potentially updating their mission. So this often came up, particularly in 2022, when it was new and people hadn't had as much time to think about how that might fit in. Sanctions also complicate financial support of Russian civil society. So even if you wanted to engage in supporting Russians that are still there, it becomes really difficult to get, say, a grant to Russian activists that are still in Russia. And so this was um, something that came up, not just with international NGOs and foundations, but with some Russian activists who had, you know, mini grants that they were distributing to activists that were still in Russia. <clears throat> and they would have to, you know, explain to the Western banks mostly why it is that they needed to send something to a Russian bank account. Um, so that has made things really difficult for that. Some of these international NGOs and foundations had given existing mobility visas to their partners in case of emergency. So um, a lot of international NGOs and foundations in the early days of the invasion were working on emergency assistance to get people out. Um, the good news there is that some people already had Schengen visas to leave. Of course, then if there are some issues with um, bans on Russian citizens holding Schengen visas, that makes that harder. But even the humanitarian visa program from Germany was used in this way. So I talked to a couple of activists who didn't leave until much later in 2022. Uh, for example, someone who didn't leave until December 2022, who had gotten his, you know, his entire family and he had gotten their humanitarian visas to Germany in you know, June or July of 2022. And they held on to them sort of as a security blanket until they deemed that it was too dangerous to stay. Um, and so this particular activist didn't leave until December when you know, the authorities were raiding his apartment. Along these lines of the mobility visas, as I had said before, some of these international NGOs and foundations had helped Russian activists relocate abroad, emergency assistance to get out of the country, and then some short-term financial support. But beyond that, it's not clear what's next or what that means for long-term support or engagement with this group of activists. And I wanted to put um, a quote on the slide here from someone at an EU-based organization uh, that supports civil society in Berlin about why it might be important to think about this group of activists differently. Um, this person said, what do you do with those that just left? They are not the same as diaspora organizations and calling them that limits their effectiveness. These activists might never be integrated into society and maintain contacts with the place that they left. And so this person was thinking about, you know, how do I explain to donors why this group is different and why this is different from say, supporting diaspora organizations that have been there for decades in Berlin. <clears throat> um, and so this is some of the logic of, of these organizations thinking through this uh, in, the, in the earlier months after the full-scale invasion. I also wanted to give some background for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar about the constraints that INGOs and foundations have been facing for a long time. So I, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on the 2015 Undesirable Organizations Law because a lot of these international NGOs and foundations were already listed as such and banned from operating in Russia officially. So 
under this law, any foreign organization that's deemed as a threat to national security can be listed. And then once listed, the organization is fully banned from Russia and violators could be fined or face up to six years in prison. So some of the, you know, sort of usual suspects that might show up on this list showed up on this list first. Um, a lot of the U.S. government funded democracy assistance funds. But as of June of this year, there were 88 organizations that had been listed and that that list is growing. So if we look at how organizations have been added to this list over time. There were a couple of organizations. It was very clear um, that they were specifically targeted with it in the early years of the law, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. But then there's a huge uptick in how often this law is being used to crack down on international organizations. And it's also including some of these diaspora organizations or these activist and exile organizations um, since the start of the full scale invasion in 2022. Most of these organizations are based in the Un European Union, then the second most are in the United States, third most in the UK, some from other countries. Um, but really, a lot of the international NGOs and funders were affected by this before anyway, and it was making their work in Russia difficult anyway. Um, so international NGO strategies have really been, for the last couple of years, working in Russia, and also I know from my other work on China, there are similar dilemmas to working in China. They've been facing this question and a dilemma between supporting activists in country versus abroad. <clears throat> this isn't a new question, but it's one that the full scale invasion of Ukraine and the, and the wave of immigration has really pushed to the front of their agendas. <clears throat> And so this is a quote from an international um, US-based international NGO who was talking about why they no longer fund Russian civil society organizations in Russia. If we were get, to get money to a Russian partner, would they be able to do anything? We also need to be a little paternalistic in the sense that for our partners, uh, in the sense that our partners may make mistakes that would be more costly than usual for them. So thinking about how how could I keep my partners safe and also do I, do we have responsibility as an organization to be looking out for them even if they say, you know, we can do this. <clears throat> so that's one way to be thinking about it. Another um, consultant who's still very involved in the international com funding community focused on Russian civil society said that, you know, even if we're not engaging with Russian civil society organizations in Russia, we need to start preparing now to engage with Russia to solve the issues that we face as a global community. But at this point, it's going to be about preparing for a future Russia that is able to engage. And so there's some alignment now between how international funders are thinking about this and the way that activists are thinking about this, of what they should be doing right now. And so there might be um, more space there for support. So some conclusions for the academic project, and then I'll point to some policy conclusions. So certainly both new and old waves of Russian activists in exile are able, able to exercise voice after exit. There's lots of examples of this, but the opportunities and constraints for their activism are shaped by the host country context. Um, the Estonia versus Germany comparison makes that very clear. There are also some attempts to unite Russian activists across countries with international support, but there are limits to what we should expect them to be doing, to what they should be expected to do, um, and to the extent that they have already received um, international support. There's certainly a lot of avenues for future research. A lot of people are working on this space. Um, it, one thing that's in particular interesting to me are changes over time. And so if I can continue to do follow-up interviews um, to follow the same people and see how things are changing, I think that might be really interesting. Maybe additional host country cases, looking at the Russian government's response to these organizations, because a lot of them have ended up listed undesirable in the last couple of months. In terms of policy challenges, persistent and future challenges for this group, they're still dealing with issues regarding their paths towards legalization. How do they go from short-term visas to long-term status? A lot of them are still grappling with that. How do we get them to go from fragmentation and infighting to working it toward consolidation? There still are these major divides, not just over violence that I mentioned earlier, but also about new versus old, right? Um, who should be invited to the table? Who should have a seat at that um, European parliament meeting? Um, it tends to be those 
with political influence that have lived abroad for a long time and haven't lived in Russia for a long time. And there's been a lot of critiques within the grassroots community of, of newer activists in exile for those choices being made by the institutions that are inviting them to those talks. That um, that group of people maybe doesn't represent everyone who is within the Russian activist and exile community. And I think that's something that funders should really be aware of. Developing democratic skills and practices. We don't know what's going to happen, but this could be a good opportunity for Russian activists who have never experienced democracy to develop those skills, um, to learn from host country or EU institutions. There are also issues of transnational repression and digital security that I didn't mention much today, but certainly have come up um, in the headlines recently, some really high profile poisoning of Russian activists in exile. And from conversations, also thinking about the Chinese case, uh, activists and local law enforcement really need more training to deal with this. Uh, it's something that's that's new and that uh, often goes underreported or sort of under addressed and, and needs a lot more attention. And then there's the issue of long term support and strategy. Activists need to be thinking about them th this themselves, right? What does it mean? What does our long term strategy look like? But if international uh, NGOs and foundations are also thinking about engaging um, is there a way to think about long-term support of these activists? I'm gonna end with, why does this matter? Why should we care about this? Um, what if these people never go back? Um, what, if, you know, what if this is, you know, we're talking about exiles in Berlin after 1917, right? So military and humanitarian support for Ukraine remain paramount, but what happens after that? What happens to Russia after that? What kind of future might that look like? And there are also humanitarian reasons to engage and to protect people from persecution. It's part of the reason why a lot of the emergency assistance funds popped up and the humanitarian visas also became used. And this is also a population of skilled activists that are ready to engage with the host country internationally, with audiences remaining in Russia, um, with diaspora communities, Russian speaking diaspora communities. Maybe they could help fight Russian disinformation. There's a lot of potential um, and capacity there. And I wanted to end with no one knows what will happen next, which is true of us as academics as well. I think there's a bit of humility to be had there for we're not very good at predicting things and um, you never know. So why not be ready for these different eventual scenarios? So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Elizabeth, for a fantastic talk. As is the tradition here, I kick things off with a question to get the discussion started while everyone else ponders their remarks and their feedback for the speaker. I wanted to talk about one of the last points you raised, which had to do with sustainability, but you talked a little bit more about international donor interest in the activists rather than the activists' interest in continuing this work. So. After most big crises, you have this explosion of creativity and entrepreneurship. We saw this pandemic, we saw this war, people saying, I want to do something, I want to get involved, and here are the networks I'm going to tap to do it. And there is hopefully some, like you said, consolidation um, and some, but also people transition back to their previous lives. They lose interest, they don't have the funding to continue, um, they just can't sustain that type of um, pressure. Um, Placed on them. So you had these follow up interviews. How long do you think this explosion is going to last? Do you see activism being kind of permanently ingrained? Do you see people joining the movement that hadn't been involved before? Where? How do we make of the fact that like there is a lot of activity now, but what's going to happen as these people have to kind of come to grips with the fact that this is a really long term conflict and that they have their own maybe personal self actualization that doesn't always overlap with this societal contribution that they're trying to engineer? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's one that came up a lot more this time, right, with the um, follow-up interviews. And I think a lot of activists were expressing this summer burnout, lack of support, um, worried more about how they were going to provide for their families, right? But a lot of that has to do with some of the structural sources of their being abroad, right? That there was short-term support for them to get out, um, maybe funding for three months of, of living, 
But then after that, what happens? And so if there's not, I think, more support and structures for them, we will have more of them burn out and stop um, simply because they can't do it any longer. So if there are ways to think about how can we help them sustain this, that that would reduce the attrition that we're already seeing. But you're absolutely right that there are also people that weren't active before, and then the, the war is what um, mobilized them, and perhaps there will be new energy that's brought in. Um, there's a lot of volunteer work that's being done. The more volunteers, the less that any one person is going to feel burnout. Um, but I think that's also part of the structural conditions that they're facing. Great. Well, let's turn it over to the audience. Please just introduce yourself before you speak. And then there is a microphone in the top of the room, but as long as you speak loud enough, all of our online guests will be able to hear you. So, Carly. Um, <coughs> did you manage to talk you to the rest yourself too? What? Everybody. Could you introduce yourself to everybody as well? I'm Carly Balzer, Georgetown University. Sorry. Um, did you talk to them at all about Russian history and historical models, because the two that come to mind are Gertsen and Gargov, who were getting their newspapers into Russia, and they were being read by the government, you know, the imperial palace. Uh, and the other one, of course, is Lenin. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the policy lines on this are, uh, for the Gertsen model, somebody has got to break through the internet blockages so they can get the message in. I mean, they're not gonna smuggle paper in anymore. And for the Lenin model, uh, you know, a underground party inside the country is the kind of thing that provides a network for something that come later, hopefully better than the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. And I think um, I'm going to pull on something from my broader project to answer part of that. So I've been working a lot with Ford Foundation archival documents at the Rockefeller Archive Center in Sleepy Hollow. Um, and one reason why I'm doing that is I wanted to know, well, did the foundations ever deal with this before? There's all of these difficult times throughout history. How did they handle those, right? How did the Chinese foundations that were in Beijing handle Tiananmen? How did they handle um, the start of the Soviet Union or the end of the Cold War or things like that? So I was digging around and the Ford Foundation actually had this great um, project that George Kennan headed for a while called the East European Fund and it worked with Soviet exiles. And so they were already thinking about, you know, maybe if we work with these, this community of Soviet exiles, they might, you know, eventually have something to do with the, the future of this space. Um, and I was, I was really interested to read through all these documents when they were going back and forth and deciding to fund this initiative. And it didn't last for very long. It was in the 50s for five or six years. Um, but it's the sort of thing that, you know, we done this before, right? And so what can we learn from those historical moments um, and what it means to support this group of exiles? In the 1950s, we didn't have the same technology that we have today. And so it, it seems much more feasible to me to have those connections from people who are abroad back into the country. And a lot of people that um, I was talking to had those connections, you know, Telegram is, is still a big resource. A lot of the people abroad worked on the chat bots that are helping people figure out how to leave or how to talk to their family about the war and things like that. Um, and so even if it's not, some of them are supporting the underground networks of people who are engaged in sabotage, um, but beyond that, you know, moving into violence, um, there are, people that are figuring out ways to help those that remain, because there still are a lot of people who can't leave, who might still be anti-war or want a different future. Um, and so I think it's important to know that there are people outside the country who understand that and are still engaged with that movement as well. Great, yes, please in the front. Uh, Brent Miles, Institute for Immigration Research at George Mason University. So, my, I do the study of the Tajik diaspora and I see a lot of parallels. Um, and my research questions several years back were pretty much the same as yours, looking at, at them. And, and looking at the way diaspora groups, if we look at the broader literature on uh, politics from afar, 
Um, and this has been tried, like you mentioned with Kenan, over and over again with different countries. And frankly, it's never worked. It's been a failure every single time. And so I'm skeptical. And I look at the, the Central Asian diasporas and the Tajik diasporas who they've had the same problems working with OSCE abroad, EU, push to consolidate. They consolidated, they're consolidated, but they're still fighting all the time. They're protesting in Berlin right now. They've been protesting for almost a decade in exile. The longer that's gone on, the more it has had a negative effect on civil society in Tajikistan because of the internet. And so it's like just the opposite. And so I'm wondering why why this would be any different because I can see that being almost exactly the same scenario with the dynamics being similar. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't know, right? Um, <laughs> well, I think I think we could look at the data and see yeah. see what we have learned from other cases. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally fair. Um, I think that that's really really interesting, and I want to talk to you about it more. Yeah. Um, but I would say that there are also other things we could adjust our expectations, right? Like, what is it that we're expecting from this group of people? And I think within the German context and the Estonian context, there are Russian speaking parts of the population that are very pro Putin, that are very um, taken by um, state run Russian news sources, and so some of these groups could be involved in speaking to those populations, right? Um, and so is it is it maybe more reasonable to think from a domestic politics standpoint for those states, right? Could we use some of the capacity of these exiled journalists to then have a, an alternative independent Russian speaking news source? Both um, journalists in Germany and Estonia have been working on this. Um, to try to deal with some of those domestic politics issues of having pockets of the population that are um, paying more attention to Russian produced sources of information. Um, and I, I think it's a very well taken point, right? Like, could, should we be expecting them to like bring about democratic change? Hey, that's not fair, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that that capacity isn't there to do something that could be useful. But I'm wondering if we could look at it could it be detrimental as well? Because that's what I see with the Tajik diaspora where it's not even, not only has it not been beneficial, it's been detrimental. Do you think it's been detrimental to um, those that stayed behind? Yes. Yes, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think, yeah, I'm seeing that too, right? People also feel really um, uh, left behind, right? Um, if they decided not to leave or couldn't leave um, and so there are some informal conversations I've had with activists that stay, who are, I think, also much more critical of how um, activists are act acting abroad because they stayed. Yeah. Yeah, and the, I was, we saw that in Yugoslavia as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where yeah. it fell apart, yeah. Totally fair. Thank you. Um, in the back. Yes, please. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Karla Gatchukvart. I work in Central Asia program here in Iris, and I'm conducting a small study on violence against activists mm -hmm. in several countries, including Russia. So I was wondering if you noticed the difference between like violence or the threat of violence against, uh, depending on whether it was women or men. And also, um, are they mostly afraid of uh, government, like violence from governmental authorities or also from like other citizens. Are you thinking about transnational repression, like once they're abroad, or no, when they are in when they yeah, decide the whether they're going to leave? Um, that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about the gender dynamics of it, of the threat. I had noticed over time with um, sort of the earlier wave of people that left under Putin's third term that there are a lot of women who were worried about what would happen to their children, um, who left as soon as they could, um, and that's I think. A, vulnerability is a strange way to put it, but um, a, a point of um, contact with pressure on someone that doesn't exist as much for male activists or certainly male activists that don't have children. Um, and so that's maybe one difference I noticed by gender um, without having had much time to think about it. Um, uh, my name is Marat Elias. I was here in this school. So um, first of all, uh, let me agree with the colleague here and say that there is a lot of 
uh, room for comparison. Uh, um, for 20 years, Chechen diaspora abroad is trying to do stuff, but yeah, it's rather detrimental and uh, no uh, actual result. But uh, my question is uh, more practical, actually. So as I understood, uh, you did second set of interviews with the same people, right? Mm -hmm. the interview course. So um, I'm curious about their progress in uh, in getting the legal status in the, in these uh, countries. Are they um, applying for asylum there, or they're kind of trying to legalize themselves somehow differently? Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question is also practical. So being a part of these organizations that um, in the blacklist in Russia, like NED, for example, or others, does it mean that the person who is part of this organization and he will go to Russia, let's say, he will get arrested or some what, what happens? Yeah, uh, both good questions. So the, the legalization question for a lot of people who came to Germany in particular on, say, a short stay Schengen visa have been able to apply for the most part for a residency permit um, and have residency um, or they were able to get their humanitarian visas. Some people were able to get their humanitarian visas while in a different country. Um, so there were a couple of cases of people who were in um, Georgia or Turkey before obtaining the humanitarian visa to go to Germany. And then that comes with it, a longer term status. Um, and then in the Estonian case, there were a couple of people that had to leave and go to another third country because they couldn't stay. Um, and weren't able to get that uh, legalization for long-term residency, including somebody that I, I don't know what happened to her actually, uh, that I spoke with this summer who was a new interviewee who was dealing with that like at the time that we were speaking of trying to figure out, you know, her visa was ending in a month and trying to figure out what would come next. And so it's, um, I think, much clearer in the German case that there are these paths towards legalization that have been solidified in the last year, but in the Estonian case, the opposite. And then the question about blacklisting, are you asking about the undesirable organization listing? So technically, <laughs> if you have anything to do with one of those undesirable organizations and you, you are conducting their business in Russia, you could be um, criminally liable and sentenced to prison time. Um, and the problem, but there's lots of problems with it, but like the uh, practicality of that is that it's not supposed to be used retroactively. Right. For example, I had a grant from the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is listed as undesirable. My grant is over, but I would not at this time go back to Russia for a lot of reasons, but because that has been used in the past um, to say, you know, you still have, you have this connection to this undesirable organization, even in the past, and then people have been um, prosecuted under under the law. Thank you. Well, it's a somber note to go on, but unfortunately we're out of time, that's five o'clock. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to find something more optimistic to say, I think it's a dark time for we'll reading. Um, but thank you so much for coming. I'm sure Elizabeth can chat afterwards, anybody who's got any more questions in person. Um, our next talk is in November, so please join us with Rihoi Nishnikau on Belarus. Have a nice evening. Thank you. But please come up. We've got time.